Welcome to WRC 19, the World Radio Communication Conference here in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, where I'm very pleased to be joined in the studio today by Timothy Ellum, who is president of the International Amateur Radio Union. Timothy, welcome to the studio. Thank you, Max. We saw each other yesterday, and I know that you've been attending the, 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 the sessions here at WRC 19. Uh, what uh, particular topics are of interest to the International Amateur Radio Union? Well, the, the IARU is following a number of agenda items that may impact the amateur radio uh, service. Uh, on top of the list is agenda item 1.1, which is harmonization of 50 megahertz. And, and that has taken some uh, time and uh, some of our time of our volunteers uh, to, to work on that uh, particular topic. There's some other agenda items uh, uh, on issues that may affect some of the spectrum that's assigned to amateurs and we're following those closely. So those that are not in the know, what does harmonization of the 50 megahertz spectrum mean? Um, in uh, regions two and three, uh, we are primary in 50 to 54 meg. It's a popular amateur uh, band. In uh, Region 1, uh, there is no uh, specific allocation, and we're working to get a primary and secondary allocation for, for those amateurs in Region 1. So the globe is divided into different regions, 2 and 3 being? Uh, 2 is the Americas, 3 is the rest of the world. Region and 1, of course, is Europe and Africa. Okay, great. Let's talk about the relevance of, of uh, amateur radio nowadays. Uh, how has uh, amateur radio uh, managed to retain its importance in this, in this uh, world, which is full of different kinds of connectivity? Well, uh, the organization I represent has actually been around since 1925, and we've been uh, uh, attending uh, ITU meetings since 1927 and been a sector member here at uh, ITU since 1932. So we've, we've been around for a long time and, and we've attended a number of WRCs on spectrum issues. Um, amateur radio is still very, very relevant. Uh, this is an interconnected world. More and more people, of course, are, are able to communicate quickly. Amateur radio provides a backbone, especially when those services go down and uh, we're often called into service, for example, during emergencies times of crisis, uh, natural disasters, that type of thing. And in principle, the, uh, the, the topics that you're, that you're following here are the ones that directly affect you or the ones that might affect you in the future? Uh, both. There's some that will directly affect us and there's some that uh, will often come up, uh, affect our spectrum in the future. So we're keeping uh, eyes on what's relevant now, but also what will be relevant in the future. And I think, you know, the, the typical example of an of a amateur radio operator is someone in a dark and danky basement uh, on, on HF bands uh, operating AM or something like that, when in fact uh, we have very advanced uh, uses of, of uh, frequencies and, uh, and modes which are used, such as uh, uh, digital modes and spectrum, and, uh, sp spread spectrum, that type of thing. Talking about emergency situations, how has amateur radio really come into play in, uh, in situations like um, the Bahamas, for example, or Mozambique? Have there been particular cases where you know of? Yeah, there's a number of cases. Even in industrial, industrialized countries like Japan, for example, when they had their, uh, their, their issues uh, with, with the Tsunami and, and, and things like that, these uh, uh, crisis, times of crisis will knock out the communications backbone. And you have amateurs on the ground who uh, have equipment, they have the antennas, they have the skills, they know how to communicate, and will provide that first vital communication link before more established first responders can come in and, and set up a, a secondary network. Um, you know, I always tell the example, I'm not an engineer by any means, but in a time of crisis, I do know how to uh, operate a, a simple amateur station, make my own antenna, and use alternative sources of power to, to communicate. And, and that's, that's the, the key factor. We're on the ground. We're already there. We have our own equipment. Are there any facts and figures about how many people are using amateur radio nowadays? Uh, there's about 3 million radio amateurs uh, in, in the world. And uh, our organization uh, is made up of uh, over 160 member societies in various different countries uh, who uh, represent the amateur interests in, in, to their national regulators. How long does it take to get a license and, uh, and how can one set oneself up modestly to do this? Well, uh, licensing varies uh, around the world, of course, but it is quite straightforward. There is no longer a, a requirement to know Morse code, for example, or to be tested in it in most countries. Um, there's typically classes that will get you an entry-level license very quickly in the space of like, two or three weeks, if, if, if need be, even, even shorter. 
And in terms of equipment, what kind of equipment do people need? Uh, if Depending on what frequencies you want to operate on, there's uh, uh, VHF and UHF and higher spectrum. It's a very easy to obtain uh, some low cost, um, uh, handy talkie type devices which uh, go through a a amateur repeaters. And, and those are in the neighborhood of sub $100 US, for example. And if you want to get on HF, certainly there's equipment that will allow you to get on for a bit more than that. And what's already has lasted this long, how do you see the future? It will continue, uh, not maybe in its present form, but uh, amateurs are experimental. They are developing new ways to communicate, and I'm sure that will continue in the future. That's with Adam. Thank you very much for joining us in the studio, and hopefully we'll catch up with you again at some stage in the near future too. Excellent. Thank you, Max. Thanks a lot.